With the fourth pick in the first round of the 2023 NWSL Draft, New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC select Jenna Nicewanger from Florida State University. Jenna, I'm going to hop right into some of your accolades. Um, you have won two national championships in the ECNL and one in the DA. You attended Florida State winning three ACC championships along with one national championship among receiving individual awards. You were the fourth overall pick in the NWSL draft, congratulations, in 2023 for Gotham FC, currently sitting in third place, but essentially tied with Portland Thorns for second in points. Um, Furthermore, you have made multiple appearances with the women's national team from U16 all the way up to the U23s. Wow. Um, so welcome. Um, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, what's really cool too is you're on the East Coast I'm on the, and I'm on the West Coast. So it was fun to coordinate all that information. Um, so one of the stats that's going to lead into a question that I actually did not say that I want to bring up now. Um, you are actually in the record books at Florida State for being the second all time leader in assists with 34. If someone were to see you play today in the NWSL for Gotham, what would they see to say it makes sense that she actually holds that record? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think I love like assisting. I think my, I know my specialties, like my specialties passing and my vision, it's not taking players on one V one and that kind of thing. So I think they would see that I'm playing a much different position. Now I'm playing left back at Gotham. And when I went to Florida state, I played the 10. So it was obviously like a lot more of an attacking role, but I'm trying to bring what I know from the 10 to the three, which is the left back and use that. So I think they would still try to see my like attacking qualities my vision and my passing abilities at the three. And then mm -hmm. hopefully they would see that and see some of my crosses and okay, that makes sense. I guess that she has 34 career assists at Florida state, but. Yeah. I thought it was such a, such an awesome stat. And also too, when I was doing research, what I think is really awesome for people to realize is that you've played multiple positions and you mentioned the word vision. How has being open to wanting to play multiple positions and having that vision like added to your ability to put yourself in positions to like have that opportunity to play at different levels? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think if you're like, if you have like vision, you're like a smart player, it's easier for you to get opportunities to play. Um, obviously, if you're Cristiano Ronaldo, you can kind of play like wherever you want to play. But for like most people, I mean, you have to like take the opportunities you get. Like my first year at Florida State, they I had two amazing attacking midfielders. So I had to play right forward. That was like the only way for me to start. So I had to take that. Um, and it's not always like easy. I didn't love being switched to left back, like right when it happened, when I went professional, but I realized like, this is where the team needed me and this is where I can have an impact. Mm. So that's like, I guess I forget where I'm going with this, but um, I think having a vision and like having soccer smarts is so helpful when you want to get on the field. Like you have to be able to adjust and be versatile. Like that's the best way I think to get on a team is just to be versatile and be open. Understand that like kind of everything happens for a reason. Like I'm playing left back. If you asked me that three months ago, I would have been like, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. now, I really like the position. And I think that there is so much opportunity for me to grow there. And I'm excited to see like where that position takes me. Mm. Um, so your comfort with, having essentially two feet on the ball. I, I noticed that you were very comfortable in a lot of highlights that I watched using your left, which is that I believe is your primary, and yes, then, yeah. your, then your right. But also what I think people would be interested to hear are some of the stories about your ability to score from corner kicks. And I feel like there have been some moments um, in your career where they were very impactful in moments of scoring from the corner. So. If you could bring us back to 
maybe those moments and how you got so comfortable to be able to bend the ball, curve the ball, manipulate the ball, put texture on the ball, however you want to say it, um, from the corner into the goal. Yeah, I've just been practicing. I've been taking free kicks, I think, since I started club soccer, mm. so which is like a while ago. Um, and when I got to Florida State, I just kind of wanted to like work on perfecting it. Obviously, like the higher level you go, the more difficult it is to like succeed in corner kicks because the goalkeepers are just so much better. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just practiced free kick or corner kicks a lot while I was at Florida State, and then I just seemed to kind of like get it down when I was a senior. And um, we also had like such good physical presence in the box as well we had a lot of good like headers on the team so I think mm. that helped like distract the goalkeeper as well but um yeah just like practicing a lot I think I used to practice like bending the ball for a shot a lot and I think I just used like that kind of technique to take the corner which helped and I mean being left-footed is such like a good ability to, like to have obviously it's, like, <laughs> yeah forward, it's, you can't really control it but I think a lot of teams are always looking for like lefties, which is, I mean, that's great. So yeah. I'm not complaining. <laughs> yeah. Um, from an in game perspective for players who are, and want to make that leap from college soccer to professional soccer, what were, and are some of the transitions that you went through and are going through? Mm -hmm. Um, just so many, I think from, so many different aspects of life um I mean soccer wise it's been so great like I just think that the jump has been like good I think I owe it a lot to like my teammates and how much they've helped me going through this transition and like the coaches and everything mm -hmm. but it's so great I mean you never want to be comfortable as a soccer player and I think as I left Florida state, I graduated. I realized that I could have taken my fifth year, but I think I would have been like too comfortable. And I wanted to step outside of my comfort zone again and try to get better. Um, so decided to go professionally and I've just like never looked back. I think every day is like a challenge and you have to bring your best to practice every single day. And I've loved that. And this team, like we always are bringing out the best in each other, asking questions and competing really hard at practice so when we go into the games like we're ready to fight and win um I think also like might be a little bit more unspoken but when people talk about the transition from college professional but it is very different on like your social life mm. um, it's more people you have such like a wider range of age from I think our youngest is 21 to I think we have like a 39 year old so it's not like the college environment where everyone is best friends on the team and we're hanging out we're all living together I think that was like a big challenge um to coming in just kind of like finding your friends on the team and understanding that like you're not going to hang out with them every day you're going to hang out with them maybe twice a week or that kind of thing that was also hard and you have that like feeling of a little bit of like loneliness maybe when you first start out depending on like what team you going to and how many I'm the only rookie on the team so that also was like a challenge yeah but um yeah you end up like I mean if you if you're nice and everything and like you're outgoing like you're gonna find teammates and my team's just been wonderful so I could talk forever about like the changes I've had to go through too because I'm also playing a new position and that's been incredibly like stressful like I kind of already discussed but um mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just been a lot of change, but I think a lot of it has just been great change. And <clears throat> to follow up with that, like in terms of in the game actions, like mm -hmm. obviously the the talent obviously is higher, right? Because it's now professional. Um, but like what specifically did you notice right away during training or in game where it's like, Florida State and college division one was this, but this is that. Yeah. I think it's just not to like oversimplify it, but it's just everything. Mm -hmm. Like they're stronger, faster, more technical. I think even like for the corners, I'm not even close to scoring on a corner here because the goalkeepers are just so good. I've had to wow. like keep working on my corners and improving them constantly. So yeah, I just think that at practice, it's just such a professional environment. Everyone shows up 
they don't show up because to me, it doesn't feel like people show up because they like have to be there. Like everyone shows up and they want to get better. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's just an environment that it is a lot more like high stakes. Um, if you miss a shot here, it's kind of like crap. Um, you're like kind of, it's more, I don't want to say more of a stressful environment, but kind of like that where it's like in college, it was like, okay, like I'll just take another one. But here it's like, Mm -hmm. you want to be, you want to work. Obviously you're never going to be perfect, but you want to work towards perfection every day. Mm -hmm. And, um, on the field, it's just like a lot more organized. I think people are holding others more accountable, which I think is like great. Um, yeah. And everything is just, um, a lot more like serious, I guess. Sure. Um, Yeah. If that makes sense. I don't know. Yeah. It's been great, but no, it's been a lot of changes on the field. And I think it's been great though. Like I'm so much more tired after these games mentally. (laughs) Like I can't even talk in interviews. I keep forgetting what I'm thinking because you have to be so on in the NWSL, like the transitions, everyone is so good. So every game is hard and like, there's no easy game, which I think is great. It helps me improve like every game. Yeah. That's awesome to hear. Oh, so because of your experience is so unique and it's kind of fresh like i'm actually really excited to ask this next question because i really like i was talking to some people yesterday and i was like we all kind of agreed that this was going to be like a really good question so i'm actually really excited so can you break down the process of transitioning from florida state to being drafted fourth in the nwsl from an off the field experience meaning did you have an agent did an agent find you? How was that process in terms of like, they already love your abilities. <clears throat> they love your talents. But like, what was it like for you with like the business side of it all? Yeah, so I actually have kind of a wild story, but I was planning to go to Europe after college. So I had like told newspapers in Tallahassee and I guess that somehow like got spread around. But I had a great season, a great senior season, thankfully, um, at Florida State. I mean, thanks a lot in part to like, I had a new coach and um, great teammates, but we were lucky enough, like we had a great season and I personally had a great season. And so my old coach, Margaret Corian, who was my coach for three years, he got me in touch with um, an agent and I spoke to a few, chose one, and then I was speaking to my agent and he was like, well, yeah, like, I think you could go high in the draft. And I was like, what? (laughs) I was so surprised. I never thought like that I would. And so decided to try out the NWSL and yeah, I was excited about it. And here I am, like, I don't know, I can't believe it, but yeah. (laughs) What? Um, It wasn't Mm -hmm. a crazy process. Yeah. Just choosing an agent, figuring out which one was best for me. Like, which one kind of aligns with like what I want in my vision and my morals and everything. And I'm really happy with who I chose and Mm -hmm. yeah, it's been great, but. Yeah. I was going to follow up with like, how did you decide between the agents, which you just answered right there? Just like you had a a vibe and everything aligned with you. Um, Mm -hmm. That's, oh man, that's so, it's just, it's amazing how just quickly it happened for you. Yeah. Literally within a month, I think. I think I coach reached out to me like a few days before the draft and he was like are you going in the draft and I'm like yeah (laughs) I'm not going to Europe anymore so yeah it is crazy how like quickly things change but how well they can fall into place Mm -hmm. I think too so yeah and and going from west coast I know you played in Florida but Mm -hmm. now you're playing in the east coast did like did playing for Gotham even cross your mind or or like like now that you're there like when you look back like I never would have thought I'd be here like living on on the east coast um yeah I think knowing the NWSL NWSL draft knowing that like anyone can choose you Mm -hmm. I think I had my mind open to anything but um yeah I am like just genuinely so grateful that I was chosen by Gotham I love the coaching staff and the team and Um, I think we have like a good thing going. So yeah, I'm grateful that they chose me, but it is crazy. I somehow thought I'd find myself back on the West coast again, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to love it. Like, I guess I'm liking the lake more than 
not able to go to the ocean very much, but yeah, it's been great. Um, it's slowly becoming home, I think, which is nice. What would you say is the biggest difference in terms of the West Coast and East Coast, aside from the weather, but like, is it the food? Is it the people? Is it like <clears throat> the overall culture? I mean, obviously you, you can kind of compare L- LA to New York in terms of like the same kind of synergies, but like, what is it that you're like, ah, oh, I miss this about the West Coast, but I'm actually falling in love with like this and like on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So I lived like right near PCH, which I love like seeing the sunsets and going to the beach, which I just think is like the best. Mm. Um, But I am like, I kind of alluded to, I'm finding a new alternative, which is going to the lake, which has been really nice because I always loved like swimming around and stuff. And that's been what I've been doing since I was like young. Um, I think the biggest thing that I like love about New Jersey is just, it's so green Mm. in California. Like there's not that in Southern California, at least in hunting or where I'm from Huntington beach, Mm -hmm. there's not a bunch of like green trees everywhere and everything like that. Um, Half of my family, like my mom is from Maine. So I think it's nice kind of, I feel like I'm back in Maine and I can kind of feel like I'm home when I'm seeing like corn growing on the side of the road and like, trees in the background and it's just so pretty and I think yeah when you grow up not having green trees like this you really do like learn to appreciate it and I think it's been fun so far and it's going to be nice to like go through all the different seasons but the snow is going to be interesting (laughs) yeah so not to potentially create a viral moment but what is pizza better in in the west coast or is pizza better in the west coast <laughs> I had not to huge, ask I'm not a huge pizza person okay but I came here for an ECNL tournament mm. when I was like 15 and I had this like famous pizza and I do think it it is like it's really good same with like the egg sa- the bagel sandwiches and stuff like that mm, yeah. they're just really good here I don't know if west coast claims to be good at pizza but I believe New York and their claims. So I think it's been good so far. All right. Um, Congratulations on being named the NWSL Rookie of the Year in May. What, so with that being said. Rookie of the month, sorry. Oh yeah, of the month, sorry, excuse me. Yeah, Yeah. I don't want to get ahead of myself. (laughs) Um, What is a week in the life of being like a professional soccer player in the NWSL? Like if you could like paint a picture for someone what would that picture look like? Okay, I would practice, like for me, I think it's just practice in the morning, probably like one or two off days during the week just to recover because we are going like hard and training hard during practice. Um, And then in the afternoon, it's like, I always joke my job is just to relax and just recover, put my recovery needs first whether that's like rolling out, stretching, going to yoga, that kind of thing. Um, And then a game, like either traveling to an away game for on Saturday or Sunday or um, playing at home and going to the hotel early to eat like a pregame meal and have a meeting, stuff like that. I don't think for me, just because it's my first year, like it's not been that crazy. I've not been doing anything like too different. I'm just trying to stay in like much as I can like a controlled environment and mm-hmm. lay low and <laughs> I don't know what's to come so I like to keep my energy for the games and not do anything too crazy what do you do do you have like a pregame ritual that you do um do you like read something listen to a certain kind of music uh do you um because it's going to elude into my next question but like yeah do you have anything that you do that uh, is kind of like a jinx for yourself that you kind of like oh I gotta do this to like put myself you know in the right spot Mm -hmm. I've tried I used to have a lot of jinxes in the past so I'm trying to like work like away from them Mm. um but I think like I I always have like pancakes for pregame meal along with like a protein and maybe like rice or something. So I think a lot of my things that I like to keep consistent, I like to think are like good for me in performing. I don't like to be like, oh, I have to wear like this headband because I think for me, like I understand that it is a good controllable for other people. But I think for me, it's just caused me like more stress than like necessary to like make sure I have it or whatever. But so I think of like all the things I like, I am jinx about. I think that they are helping me so I always like take 
a shot of pickle juice before the game to help with cramping. And I take like a goo before the game to help like with energy and stuff like that. I drink a coffee for energy. Like, I don't know. So if that makes sense, but yeah, I don't think I have any like jinx jinxes really, unless it's like relating more to like the game. So this topic I find when I ask players about <clears throat> it's they they sometimes actually are so surprised about it so there's focus and then there's like hyper focus and there's like that in the you know competitive mindset so have you ever had coaching with that meaning like has anyone talked to you about like what it's like what it means to look like you're so hyper focused that like nothing else could be going on because I feel like some of the players that I've been around, um, when I see them just go, it's like, they're just like, nothing else could like, you know, interfere with like their thought process. And like you just mentioned, like, you're so exhausted after a game mentally. So mm -hmm. it kind of shows how hyper-focused you get. Like, do you recognize that? Do you know when that switch comes? Like, um, have you thought about it from that perspective of like, yeah, you have to kind of be able to, do that to obviously play at this level uh yeah I actually that's like an interesting topic I've never really thought about like okay this is my time to switch on um I do try to keep it like pretty I try to be upbeat a little bit like sing the songs that are playing in the stadium when I'm warming up just to be like calm mm -hmm. but yeah I do think it is like important I think to understand I don't really know like when I switch on I think it's probably like when I go back in the locker room after warm-up but no I think that's like really interesting because it is important to be able to like switch everything off like anything that's going on at home or with your family or with your friends whatever the importance of yeah like switching that off and I think that is pretty interesting to think about so <clears throat> obviously being a big athlete nut that I am um, and have done tons of research before, I actually want to share a story about Michael Phelps. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are since you are interested in this topic. Um, I'm kind of segueing off the questions I have just because we're having this conversation. Yeah, do it. Um, so when he was growing up and was started competing at a young age, he had a uh, pretty much a primary coach who would tell him, I want you to envision yourself on the blocks and I want you to envision yourself actually diving into the water. And I want you to envision that your goggles slip, but that you continue racing and that you don't let the chlorine or the fact that the goggles slipped affect you. Mm -hmm. And what he would do is he would have him, it was a trigger word. It was like put on the tape. And it was when the coach said put on the tape, Michael would then like, close his eyes and like envision that happening. So he would do this throughout his entire career. And so in one of the Olympics, he dove and the goggles slipped. And I can't remember if it was that race that he broke a record. He definitely won a medal for sure. But the reporter like had the still image and was like, Michael, like, how are you able to like continue swimming and your goggles slip? He's like, he literally said, I've done it so many times that when it happened, it wasn't like new, like it, it's already happened to me t so many times. So to kind of segue more into that is the more you do something, the neurons actually fire slower in your brain. So for like you and I going behind a wheel of a car, we're pretty calm, right? Yeah. Like it's like we've done it like a thousand times. We mm -hmm. put someone who's, you know, t uh, a student driver behind a car, their neurons are firing like crazy. So going back to you like obviously playing at such a young age did you also like watch the game did you break down the game like do you feel the game is slow at times like I know the pace and like the competitiveness mm -hmm. is at the highest level but like do you feel sometimes that you can read things and you're kind of at ease when you're playing um yeah I think like I've noticed as the season's gone on, I think, I don't know where confidence has gone up and stress has gone down, but I do think mm. that that's kind of like what has happened, which is nice as I've gotten more games under my belt. But 
yeah, I've always, I've grown up, like, like I said, watching Man United, watching the English Premier League, um, soccer has like always been like who I am, a mm-hmm. part, or part of my identity, I guess. So I've loved like watching games. I always watch games with my dad and we've never watched it like purely for like tactical reasons, but I think those kind of conversations would like always come up. Like we would mm-hmm. always watch Barcelona because they were so good and so important to watch um so yeah I think that that watching soccer has helped me like subconsciously I think like put myself in situations where like okay well this I've seen this player do this so I can try this too and maybe it'll work maybe it won't but I mean that's why you practice it so mm-hmm. yeah I think but that's like a cool story about Michael Phelps I think but it is good that I think now watching soccer is becoming so accessible. Like it's becoming so much easier to watch the NWSL. So girls can like see themselves envision themselves playing the games by like mm-hmm. watching girls or women play that play it now in the NWSL, which I think is pretty cool. Going back to like, you mentioned you watched it and obviously you started at such a young age. <clears throat> what outside factors did you, or would you say contributed to like your ability to put you in the position you are in now? Like, did you train twice a week with your club or three mm-hmm. I'm sure obviously got more as the, the higher level you went and obviously the club that you were um, in, but um, did you train four days a week with your team? Did you train three days a week with your team? Did you go do supplemental training? Um, what was that supplemental training like? Did you do technical work? Did you do, you know, working on your body mental work like what was your process to like really round out your club training with other aspects um I think I had training two times a week when I was like growing up and then maybe in high school it went to three times a week but Mm -hmm. I did some individual trainings on the side maybe like once or twice a week and then days where I did not practice I was just playing in my backyard like juggling or throwing some cones around and like dribbling I think I just it was important for me to like always touch the ball like whether it was like juggling for 15 minutes or like an hour like working on skills and stuff like that I was just creating a relationship with the ball like every day as much as I could so yeah I think like as much as team practice is important in one-on-one like group training private training is like equally important as well as training on your own and just kind of like discovering yourself with the ball is equally important when no one else is watching. Yeah. It's um, I feel like just depending on how much you love the game, right? Like you're going to, you're going to put more into it. You're going to, you know, attend more time to it. Um, Mm -hmm. I'd be curious what your thoughts are on this because um, for someone who has had this long journey, and still continuing um so like right now two of my club teams they train three days a week on the field and we do a four session with film training for only 30 minutes just because everyone's different with their attention span and also you don't want to do too many different topics um Mm -hmm. but the youngest team is nine and the oldest team is 13. um i'm curious what your thoughts are on that kind of a regiment um because it's interesting seeing the difference of the players who watch the film and break it down and the players who maybe just they're not ready yet or maybe they're still feeling out the game they're not really too sure if they want to dive all in but you can see like the the roundness of their kind of like game when they train on the ball that means their confidence is getting high they're getting comfortable as you mentioned then they watch the game and you have questions and you ask why did this happen where was the ball? Where was the goalie? What was the score? Like all these different, like what part of the field were you in? Um, but when you hear that this newer generation is training with their club teams already four days a week and also doing film um, along with agility and that kind of stuff, what does it make you think about uh, when you when you think about your practices back in the day to like how this new generation is coming up with like more training, but also different kind of trainings? Yeah. I think it's great. I mean, you can't train with the ball constantly, but if you want to kind of like learn more about soccer, watching film or like watching a game is like a perfect way to do that. So, and I think it's all about like 
balance. Like if you play outside by yourself all the time and that's all you do, you're not going to be this great team player. And I, so I think adding in like different elements is so important. And I didn't watch film until I was in college. I didn't watch myself play. Like I wasn't able to watch myself play until I got to college. Wow. And I think that's something that like probably, yeah, like high school players and younger kids, like we missed that growing up. So I think that's such, it's such an important element to the game. So I think it's great. I mean, even if you're introducing it and half the players don't understand it and half the players do, they're still stimulating their mind and they're starting to understand it and they're going to understand it quicker than if it was never introduced to them. Mm. So I think that's a, like a really great tool. How much is film um, introduced at the professional level um, being your first year? Uh, like, is it like pregame, postgame? Is it like clips? Is it one on one? Is it with a team? Mm-hmm. Uh, we do like positional meetings, mm-hmm. clips about like going over our games. We do. We watch film on the other team. We watch film on ourselves, and then there is like opportunity for one on one coaching as well. Like film is just such an important tool. Like I couldn't even fathom going into a game and not having watched the team anymore. I just can't. I think that would be so insane. <laughs> That's how important it is. So yeah, it's like, I mean, even being in a new position, like I've brought up multiple times, like mm-hmm. I love watching who the team I'm going against because anything I can control at this point in that new position is like so important. So if I know certain things about a player I'm going against, like, I think that that's always helpful. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, okay. So we talked a little bit about your background, um, in terms of also having the opportunity to play for the crest for the women's national team, um, Mm -hmm. from the youth ages going up to the U23s. What is the environment like? within that program because obviously you played at different ages Mm -hmm. um and what's your advice for someone who wants to add that to their resume like to be able to accomplish being selected going to a training camp and yeah so like if someone right now is currently playing in the ecnl and they're like i want to break into you know the women's national team at u16 Mm -hmm. what's the environment like in that environment And then what advice would you give them to like get there, but also be able to stay? Yeah. Um, I think the environment first off is like, it's different. I wouldn't say like, it's hard or it's easy. It's just, it's different from what you're used to at the club level. It's like, once again, you're kind of stepping out of your comfort zone, but um, I think it's good. It's always good to have those camps. I can't, I think for me and my journey, growing up in youth camps I think I was cut like countless number of times and then invited in like everyone's success is defined differently and I think my first camp I went to I was 13 and I got cut because I was like short and skinny (laughs) and then it's and I was funny enough playing left back so (laughs) during that time Uh um but I think yeah just when you're 16 and you're wanting to break in I think um having conversations with your coach maybe if they have connections to the national team if they can get feedback on what the national team is looking for in comparison to like you as a player I think my coach my club coach played like a huge role in helping me get to the national team level and as well as like my team was competitive obviously in the Mm -hmm. ECNL so I that gave me a lot of exposure as well I can't necessarily say like oh this one thing helped me because I think it was a bunch of different things and a bunch of little successes but Mm -hmm. I think yeah like the club you play for and the coach that you have is also like very important and also as well as like obviously who you are as a player so I have a follow-up question because you mentioned being cut multiple times so like what's that process like so like, again, obviously you love the game. So you just kept going. Like, you, like it didn't, like, or maybe did it ever waver you? Like, when you got um, cut? Yeah. So, I mean, starting at, like, the ODP level, I, I never just, like, started out and made the team. Like, it was, I don't think my journey necessarily has ever just been a smooth ride. Like, I've had a bunch of bumps along the way, like, of course, as everyone has. But I think when you're 14 and you're getting cut, you're 14, like you're so young. And I was never like, oh, this is the end. This is the end. Like I always believed in myself. 
And that's the most important thing. I had like two amazing parents that believed in me too. And it was never like, this is the end of the days because I've been cut at like 13. It's one coach's opinion. It's not the whole world's opinion. So yeah, you just kind of like keep going. I worked harder. Like I think when I got cut from ODP, it was because of my fitness. So then what did I do? Like I went and I got fitter and I ran more. Mm. And next year I made the team. And I think that's kind of like at the U14, I got cut and then I got invited back in and I got cut again, like <laughs> twice within the same year. And then you just keep working hard. Like you work harder, you take the advice that they give you on what you need to work on. I mean, at the end of the day, like it's never, yeah, like I said, it's never one person's opinion that's going to define your success. There's so many people out there. Like if I wasn't successful in the US, that doesn't mean I would just quit. I would go to Europe and try out that kind of thing. So I don't know. It's just like the most important thing you can do, like when you're growing up is love the game and believe in yourself and don't let one person's opinion kill how you think about yourself and your love for soccer. Yeah, that's awesome, <clears throat> man. Um, okay, so I had to tell a parent that is a huge NWSL fan and whose daughter is actually left-footed um, that I was going to be speaking with you. And so I offered him to think of a question that he would love to ask that could maybe benefit him as a parent um, of watching soccer or also maybe his daughter. So the question that he kind of formulated was what about your mental slash emotional approach to the game today do you wish you'd known as a younger player um sorry can you repeat the question yeah um what about your mental slash emotional approach to the game today do you wish you'd known as a younger player hmm okay that's a good question <laughs> yeah we could think on that for a little. Yeah, no problem. He, like I said, he's a he's a writer, so um, it was very well formulated. Uh, his his uh, he actually has a follow up, so maybe the follow up would actually maybe right. spark something. How do you protect your confidence when facing mistakes and okay. or adversity? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone goes through adversity. Like that's not an opinion that's fact but mm -hmm. I think I was talking with my mom like a while ago and I just said when you're kind of like down and out like as geez I feel like I'm always being tested whether like I think I'm coming in and I'm playing this position and I'm actually playing this one like why doesn't it always go like the way that it's planned to go that kind of thing uh -huh. it's easy to ask yourself that question but I believe in myself at the end of the day that I'm a good player and that I can be successful. And I truly believe that like what you put into it, you will get out of it. And if you have a good attitude about something, then the outcome has a higher possibility of being good. And so I decided like I could have, it would have been easy to like mope and groan about playing this position that I've never played before, but and I did, I did for like three days. I'm not going to lie. I was like bummed out, yeah. but I was faced with the question. Am I going to like, let this kill where I'm at? Or am I going to work hard and practice? And am I going to learn? And I'm going to have a good attitude about it because it's going to help my team. Um, kind of went off track of the question, but it was, no, like, it was, it was great. <laughs> it was good. Okay. Well, I just think like, I don't, I mean, I, I know that I was always like had good confidence growing up, but I just think, yeah, it's like my advice to younger players when they're dealing with like adversity and everything is just to like, believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. You're so young when you're in middle school or like in high school and your soccer journey, you have so many years ahead of you that you can't let like one little bump get in the way of like your dreams. And to just remember that the best soccer players in the world have adversity and like they're so good because of how they reacted to the adversity yeah. you're not like if you're bummed out for getting cut you're allowed to be upset and you're allowed to ask like why did I get cut why me that kind of thing for a couple of days but then you need to get back on your horse and like start practicing and understand that 
everyone's been cut from something before. No one's journey's ever been perfect. So once you mm -hmm. realize that, I think that's it's easier to kind of come to terms like with the adversity that you've been given, you've been given and work harder. I think that makes everything you earn like a little bit sweeter too, because you've worked so hard for it. So you sparked a, a story again, uh, since you're a Man U fan, I think you actually would be, you'll actually really appreciate this. So I used to coach um, a little boy here in LA. Uh, he was only six when I came across him and I was like, this kid's got it. Like he's, he's a nut, Like he's just, he's mean, but he's like the softest nut guy ever. Like, and he just loves the game. So I was training him for uh, about a year and then his parents are actually from uh, London. So they went back after COVID got, you know, loosened up and he went to this big Chelsea, like <clears throat> just like a training thing. It wasn't like a scouting. It was just like, come out and play for Chelsea. Okay. But he actually got scouted. And cause that, yeah. that was the whole point to be like yeah. non yeah I was kind of like you know so the dad calls me and he's like what do you think I'm like what do you mean like yeah you should go like Chelsea FC Academy of course like why would you not go in that training environment so long story short um he's now I think seven or eight and he's now playing in the Chelsea FC Academy uh system mm -hmm. but the dad told me a story about Casemiro so and being a Man U fan so going back to what you said so <laughs> Casemiro actually was the Man U system I had no idea I didn't know that either. As much as a fan I am of the game and you are, yeah. I, I, I was like, wait, what? I was like, so what happened was Casimir played as a nine, as a striker in the Man U system. And by the time he was like U12, they went to him and said, we're no longer going to pick you to be in this position. Mm -hmm. So you can leave or you, or, or you can stay and we can, you know, find another spot for you. And so Casimir was like, yeah, no, I, I want to stay. And Casimir asked, like, what's the position left? The six. That was the only spot left, like CDM. And so it's just crazy. It's like, again, he just loved, he just wanted to play. He just wanted yeah. to play so bad. And obviously he goes to Real Madrid, has the career he had there. Now he's back at Man U and he's still playing in that position. So it just kind of... It brings a smile to my face because it's like if you just love what you're doing, whether it's soccer or reading books or you know playing tennis, whatever the case may be, if you just really love it, like you can accomplish a lot. Like, and I think what what's your opinion about playing Division One, but then also not playing Division One, and the stigma behind if you don't play Division One that you're not like good enough or something's wrong with you. Yeah, I don't think that I don't think like playing division one or playing division two is going to like determine your mm -hmm. outcome. Like obviously division one, it is, I think it's more competitive and you're going to have better resources and everything like that. But just because you go division two or anything like that doesn't mean that you're at your end of the road when you tr like graduate senior year everyone's just everyone's path is different and that's how it is and I think too like whether you graduate out of college and you have to go to play in Iceland for two years to get some experience or whatever and then you mm -hmm. come back to the NFL. so that doesn't take away from the fact that you're playing in the NWSL when you're playing division two it doesn't take away from the fact that you've gone pro now it doesn't matter how you get there, but as long as you get there and you achieve your goal, like it doesn't matter the path that you took. Yeah. All right. So final question um, before we get into the, the last segment. So what's next? Um, is there something next that you think about? Like, what is it that for Jenna is on your mind in terms of to achieve or to do if there are those thoughts? Yeah, I think there's being new in the NWSL, there's so much to accomplish. <laughs> I haven't won anything. So I think, yeah, like um, working, my team is still like, obviously we're in third place. Um, so I think it's just working to get into playoffs immediately. But individually, I think it's just um, continuing to grow every day at training. I have so much to improve upon, of course. So I think that's something that's like exciting. I have the opportunity to get better every day. And I have teammates that are competing against me so hard. I know 
that I have a lot of things to work on at left back. That's not, it's not hidden. Um, like, so I think just excited to take what I've learned from the season and then continue to grow off of it. Yeah. Keep learning. Well, you have one of the best outside backs that I've watched, um, on your roster. So, uh, you have the resources that I'm sure yeah. to, uh, speak with Kelly for some, for some advice. Yeah. Uh, and Allie Krieger too. She's and Allie. Been yeah. So helpful. Yeah. And she was also curtain from wrong. Was she also the reason why you went on? Cause she got hurt at one point in time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's ah, wild. It's just crazy. Yeah. That gave me like, I think I went in eight minutes in for our first game of the season. Mm. <laughs> My friends were like, they watched the game and they were laughing because they said I was like this the whole time. I was like, so pissed. <laughs> like I was hyper focused that game if I've ever been hyper focused before. But yeah, no, that was, was great. Uh, yeah, you must have slept like a baby that night. You must have been exhausted. From... I was so tired. <laughs> yeah. Um. So at the end of these uh, interviews that we do, I always let the guests um, flip the script in terms of like, when they look back on their journey, if, if they could ask a coach a question, um, obviously my experience is mainly, you know, in the youth, youth area for 15 years, um, some high school coaching as well. So if you, has there been a question that, has crossed your mind since we've been talking that, you know, that has come up or where are you at with that? Um, I don't know if this is like a con- like a common question, but I'm going to change it a little bit. Okay. I think if I was on your team now mm. and I was a youth player, I think my question to you would be like, what can I do better? What can I improve upon? <sighs> and so I think that's something that, it's so important for players when they're younger to ask. It's kind of easy to just go into practice, do what they say, but it's also important to work on yourself individually as much as the team. And I did ask that. I did ask my club coach that growing up, but I don't think I asked it enough Mm. and asked for enough feedback. So I think with film nowadays and Mm. obviously every coach knows, should know like what each player can improve upon the importance of that question just, grows because now you can watch it in film and now you can also work on it from the side as well this has come from years of experience so i wouldn't have given you this answer even say five years ago but the answer that i would give a player now is minimize mistakes and maximize your opportunities which means you'll never be perfect yes you want to strive for it but don't try to be Mm -hmm. um so for example, like last night we're watching film with both of the teams and I reiterated to them that when we watch a clip for 10 seconds, it's, we don't watch it to say, okay, we're going to fix this mistake and this will never happen in terms of the, the negative outcome. It's more like if this scenario happens 10 times, can we as a team eight times do it pretty close to perfection? Mm-hmm. but also allow those two times of mental lapses, but then be able to quickly, you know, whether it is transition to understand how to now fix that, but it's taking that pressure off of having to be, you know, perfect um, yeah. and playing free, like just enjoying yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's hard because there's so many different pressures that even as coaches, we forget about, you know, it's pressures that you put upon yourself um maybe it's just the environment you're in of maybe the expectation that they people think you have so they start kind of saying things and you start building up these like walls of like and you're trying to keep climbing these huge walls and it's like just kind of keep it simple like you mentioned before too as well and obviously you know our connection is through you know someone that you know we both know very well and it goes back to like tips so i'm not sure like so now i would say if you're training on technical IQ, your personality and your speed within all those things, chances are of you being able to reach the heights that you want are going to be a lot higher. So if you look at film of yourself or you are objective about yourself and say, my IQ, my decision-making is pretty poor, but my technical ability is pretty strong. Well, 
okay, but you can be really technical, but if you can't make great decisions, it's like they go hand in hand. And then the personality of like that competitiveness, right? At that level, especially you at you're at now and, and where you were going and have gone, it just gets higher and higher, which also tests like your passion. Like how, like how much do you really love it? Like, um, so yeah, I would, that's kind of like, I kind of gave you a couple of different things that I would say to a player. Um, and then the caveat to all that is just the overall appetite, which is why I have decided to use soccer appetite. Cause it's like, if you don't have a high appetite, personal, like drive inside yourself for it, it's like, it's at some point in time, it's going to crack and might not be fun anymore. So yeah. And I guess maybe the last thing would be to surround yourself with like-minded people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to push you, you know, because you're going to try to get better. You're going to want to improve. You're going to be watching this. You're going to be talking about that. So yeah, that's, that's what I would say to the player. Um, you got a follow-up question or is that, that was a really that's good it. one. I, okay, cool. Um, so again, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you are extremely busy and time is valuable. Um, I hope that there will be potentially in the future a part two, because I just feel like, you gave so much valuable information for someone who either is a parent watching and listening or a player who's striving to be in your shoes. Um, so I really appreciate it because I know how much value there is to listening to someone like yourself that is in it, in it right now, um, mm -hmm. but also has been there um, and still looking to achieve more. So again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, yeah, look you forward. For yeah. Um, look forward to connecting in the future and that's the luck with the end of the season. Like I said, you guys are tied technically in second. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, just for the record, I watched one of your games early on the season, and I actually said this team is pretty good. Like they're yeah. they're kind of like a quiet. They're quiet because they don't yeah. like you know what I mean. Like they're quiet, but yeah, I think dangerous. last year Gotham had five wins. Mm. Period. So okay. we've been doing well, I think. Yeah. So best of luck. I mean. Yeah, yeah, you guys, are, like I said, and plus your colors are amazing. So you guys always look good go. too as well uh, in those yeah. colors. So yeah, best of luck with the end of the season. And um, I'll go ahead and conclude this and I will be in touch very shortly. Okay. Thanks, right. Mike. Thank you, Jenna.